scientists accelerate atoms to nearly the speed of light and blast them together to expose their fundamental constituents. Small amounts of antimatter can be made this way, but it's incredibly expensive. With a dedicated facility, the cost of producing it might come down far enough to produce usable amounts. And that's the hope of one researcher. Dr. Gerald Smith has been working for over a decade to find a way to trap this volatile substance and store it in isolation from the rest of the universe. Smith and his colleagues have designed a trap the size of a cigar case. It sits within a tank filled with liquid nitrogen and liquid helium, designed to cool it down to 270 degrees below zero. Once injected into this trap, antimatter particles are suspended by magnetic fields within a vacuum as empty as deepest space. But the problem is that anti-electrons, called positrons, tend to repel each other explosively. That makes it tough to store more than a few at a time. This team now believes it may have discovered a pathway to storing large amounts over longer periods of time. Their solution lies in combining positrons with electrons, forming an element called positronium. In theory, with the right magnetic fields, these electrically neutral atoms might be held indefinitely. When released under controlled conditions, ultra-high energy antimatter beams could turn out to be ideal cancer killers, or lead to revolutionary industrial applications, or perhaps one day, they could power long-distance spaceflight. It wouldn't take much. Antimatter is so potent that it defies common sense. A chunk the size of a small coin could propel the space shuttle into orbit. Smith estimates that once in low Earth orbit, a human mission to Mars would take as little as 10 milligrams worth. The basic idea of an antimatter rocket is simple. A beam of positrons is released into the engine core where it annihilates the surface of a metal plate. That creates an explosion that propels the craft forward. Another design uses a sail. A cloud of antimatter particles reacts explosively to its surface, propelling it forward. Short of traveling to another solar system, there may be good reasons to contemplate developing antimatter propulsion. A preliminary mission would speed beyond the orbit of Pluto, sending back close-up images of dark planet-like objects that ring the solar system out in the Kuiper Belt. A longer distance probe could reveal new details about the Oort Cloud, a vast realm of comets that envelops the solar system. Once out there, it could sample particles that make up the interstellar medium, or send back unique data sets on dark matter, the invisible stuff that makes up the overwhelming portion of our universe. To make it all the way to Alpha Centauri, within 50 years, an antimatter probe would have to gradually accelerate to around 10% the speed of light. That's 67 million miles per hour. It would then gradually decelerate as it approached its destination. At those speeds, hitting even a grain of dust could destroy the spacecraft. So it might be best to slow the journey down to a century or more. It's safe to assume for now that we would only send a probe to Alpha Centauri if we discovered a habitable world. There may be other choices in our solar neighborhood. They include Proxima Centauri, a red dwarf star 4.2 light years away that may be gravitationally bound to Alpha Centauri. Beyond that, not quite six light years away, is Barnard's star. Or there's Lalan 21185, a red dwarf 8.3 light years away. We already know it has two Jupiter-sized planets. There are at least 22 stars within 12 light-years of Earth. 
in any way you look at it, the first interstellar voyage will be a quantum leap for humanity. The urge to reach out to distant horizons, to climb the highest peaks, to push ourselves past our perceived limits, seems to be a vital part of what makes us human. Yet, explorers of old set off not just because it was there. At times it was greed, hunger, fear, or despair that propelled them outward from their homelands and allowed them to endure their long journeys. Whether we attempt to make this leap to the stars may come to depend on how we regard this planet. To the physicist Stephen Hawking, the journey is imperative. I don't think the human race, he said, will survive the next thousand years unless we spread into space. There are too many accidents that can befall life on a single planet. Indeed, we can't foresee the impact of wars, social upheaval, or the course of human civilization in coming centuries. But today, we can see the often conflicting trends that could one day propel us out into the interstellar void. On one hand, the technological advances that might make such a mission possible could revolutionize many other aspects of life on this planet. The ever-increasing rate at which numbers of transistors can be placed inexpensively on computer microchips has become a metaphor for the advance of all technologies in this century. From a few thousand transistors on the first printed circuits of the 1970s, computer chips now have billions etched onto their surfaces. Even that number could seem amazingly small in another few decades. Many observers forecast a steep rise, even an acceleration, in the pace of invention and basic research, and for whole new solutions to the problems of energy, food production, health, and more. On the other hand, major periods of scarcity may loom. In the 20th century, the world saw the largest increase in its human population, from less than 2 billion up to 6 billion. The world's population is now around 6.8 billion. It's expected to reach 9 to 10 billion by the year 2040, with the biggest gains in Asia and Africa. According to a recent UN report, the world will have to produce 70% more food by the year 2050, and at least that much more energy to sustain its population. The scarcity of just simple clean water in some regions is already frightening. Now throw in environmental impacts, like rising sea levels, or the spread of deserts linked to a gradually warming climate. The culprit, to most scientists, is rising emission of greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide since the start of the Industrial Revolution. This map charts rising temperature readings from the year 1885 through to the present. In some places they've gone up by as much as two and a half degrees Fahrenheit. Computer models project the trend out to the end of this century. Depending upon population growth, energy use and conservation, temperatures could rise anywhere from two to eleven degrees more. Will technological advancements allow us to halt the degradation of our natural environments and increase the carrying capacity of our planet? Will we find ways to mitigate the impacts of war, natural catastrophes, or political upheavals? No doubt, if or when we launch our first mission beyond this solar system, the occasion will spur reflection on who and what we have become as a people, as a planet, just as the first missions to the moon and our neighboring planets once did. At first, we'll send a probe designed to relay basic information on what's there, on a world whose light we have only studied from afar. As this cosmic emissary makes its way across the void, we on Earth 
we'll continue to struggle in our pursuits of happiness and prosperity or of mere survival. When it arrives, we'll scan the data for evidence of a world like our own, one that may harbor life. How will our perspectives on that world and upon our own have changed? <laughs>